All right, today's focus uh, for our webinar is champagne. Uh, for those of you that are joining us live, we certainly appreciate it. Um, for those of you that are watching on YouTube at a later date, thank you as well. I hope that these webinars are providing um, some depth of learning and, and uh, insight into these different regions of the world. I think if you don't start your champagne presentation off with quotes from uh, Napoleon, Lily Bollinger, Mark Twain, Winston Churchill, and Coco Chanel, then uh, you're obviously not doing it right. So plenty of quotes out there uh, to make your presentations uh, much more fluid. We're going to hop straight into production. When it comes to Champagne, there's a ton to learn. We're going to look at maps in each of the regions later on as well. Um, but there's also something to be said for the process of Champagne and understanding it thoroughly. And so we're going to go through it step by step today prior to even taking a look at the maps and the different regions uh, where it can be produced. When we start with, you know, black grapes uh, and white grapes, right? Black grapes have to be pressed fairly quickly uh, after harvest um, to color the must to produce the Montclair. Uh, that first press of 2,050 liters is known as the Vin de Cuvée, and of course is the highest quality. Uh, the next 500 liters is in press is called the Vin de Taille, which is typically richer in pigment and tannin, and a lot of times it's sold off. Uh, your third press is required by law, and this is known as the Rebesh. It's typically one to 10% of the total, and most often it's used for distillate. Uh, the juice is allowed to settle after pressing, or debourbage, at a cool temperature for eight to 15 hours to rack off any of the solids, otherwise known as borbs. Uh, the must then undergoes primary fermentation. It's often chaptalized where they add sugar to it because these are fairly highly acidic grapes at this point. Uh, they re result in high, uh, excuse me, high acid of about 11% ABV or so von Claire. Um, here you can use stainless steel or oak may be used, typically neutral. Often malolactic occurs next and then clarification though through fining, filtering, and centrifuge. Now it's important to note that mallow doesn't become commonplace until the temperatures rose to appropriate levels to have it occur sometime in the 1960s. Uh, the clarified base wines are made in the barrel or the tank or sometimes the bottle until February or March of the next year. Um, after assemblage, and we've mentioned this term before, assemblage, just to reiterate, is the mix of grapes put together in a blend, whereas ensapagement is the mix of grapes growing together in a field. So after assemblage and cold stabilization, uh, the wines are bottled with the liquor de tirage, which is sugar, yeast, and wine. And I think it's cool to note that about every four grams or so of liquor de tirage gives you one atmosphere of pressure in the final uh, champagne. So to get to the six atmospheres of pressure, of full pressure champagne, you're looking at about 24 grams of liquor de tirage. Uh, the pre de mousse follows, or secondary fermentation, a crown cap or a cork is affixed along with a bid jewel. It's a plastic capsule that will capture the sediment during remuage, um, otherwise known as riddling. Uh, this process can last up to eight weeks. Your ABV will rise by only about 1.2 to 1.3%, while the CO2 uh, creates five to six atmospheres of pressure while stored sur lot or horizontally, and you can see that here. And one thing that I want to point out too, uh, at this point in the process, is where a lot of large Grand Mark houses will purchase their champagne. They don't buy grapes. Um, a lot of times they'll let it get all the way through the sur lot process and then finish it off in their own cellars and label them. Um, and I, I'm not going to start naming off names, but I think some of the biggest producers of champagne, you can probably figure that out. Uh, autolysis occurs, which is the breakdown of dead yeast cells, and it forms sediment and creates flavor in the wine. That sediment is removed via disgorgement after being trapped in the neck of the bottle. So historically um, done by pointage, briskly shaking the bottle to prevent the sediment sticking to the sides. Newer yeast strains kind of preclude that today though. Uh, but you can see here's an example of uh, Remiage de Pupitre. Uh, so this is a large A-frame with 60 angled holes cut into each plank. And this is hand riddling, right? Where these guys are coming by and briskly shaking them individually. Today, there's a Spanish uh, invention called the gyro pallet. And this number kind of changes, so it, be careful with it, but it holds approximately 504 bottles. Um, and it does it um, mechanically, which is pretty cool. So prior to the disgorgement, the bottles are placed sur point 
vertically for a short period of time. Although um, some places like Bollinger with their RD do this for decades at a time and you'll see dusty bottles upside down basically in their wine cellars. De Gorgemont a la Gloss, which was invented in 1884 by Armand Walfort, involves dipping the neck into freezing brine solution. The traditional method of De Gorgemont a la Folie uh, is required for Jeroboam and above, so without the freezing brine, causing there to be uh, a little bit more of a wine loss whenever you disgorge it. Uh, the dosage is then used to top off the wines since they are now fully dry. And that dosage is done with liquor de expedition. So sugar, syrup, and wine, right? Whereas you had uh, sugar, yeast, and wine earlier for uh, liquor de tirage. After dosage, the bottle is secured with a cork and six half twists of a mucilette. And mucilette is the wire cage that goes around it. It's then aged in bottle until release. Uh, for non-vintage wines and champagne, uh, it must remain in the cellar for 15 months, including 12 on the lees. Vintage styles have to be there for 36 months. Uh, cultured yeast has sort of become the norm, as we mentioned. Um, and, but if you want biodynamic or organic, you can utilize quartz yeast, which is uh, from Champagne Fleury. It's really the only uh, organic or biodynamic yeast strain out there for them. Uh, Wine Folly always does a really great job with their infographics, so I like to take a look at them. This includes all methods of sparkling wine production. Of course, today we're focusing on classic method in Champagne, where you can see, as we mentioned, the base wine, typically made with barely ripe grapes to prefer, preserve that high acidity. The addition of sugar and yeast, that liquor de tirage, the secondary fermentation or the prix de mousse, uh, bottling, aging on the lees, right? The riddling or rotating the lees towards the bottleneck, the degorgement, which is the freeze and remove the lees in the bottleneck, and then finish with the dosage, of course optional, and uh, corking it. Other method, methods include carbonation method, transfer method, and tank method. Uh, otherwise known as Charmant. Of course, these aren't utilized in the production of Champagne itself, but in other regions of the world. And here's another great infographic for uh, traditional method or Champagne method. You see the press, the fermentation, um, into the wine, where they blend, tirage, secondary fermentation, let it sit for a few years, disgorgement, add the dosage, call it a day. So that's for production when it comes to champagne. And I think um, understanding that process inside and out is absolutely critical whenever you're discussing not only the region, but the styles of the wines. And we're gonna get into the region and where champagne is actually produced here. I'm gonna take a look at the map from Bildsom's Fantastic. Um, you can see the Montagne de Rome here, the Valley de la Marne here, right across the Marne River, of course, the Côte de Blanc here, and then as you get further southwest, you find the Côte de Cezanne, and then southeast you'll find some, the Aube, right? Um, I threw on the Larmont maps uh, for each of the regions. This is Montagne de Rem. Uh, they're a little bit fuzzy, unfortunately, but they really are the best maps when it comes to looking at the different regions. Um, so you can see, this is the Montagne de Rome. Um, it's really east-west. Um, so you have north and south facing slopes. Um, you can see over in this slide, um, really Tauscher, extremely important. Uh, let's see, if we can, you can see Trepai, uh, Verzi, Verzenay, Maï Champagne, Lude here to the furthest in the west. Um, let's see if we can pull up a little zoom in right here. Yeah, really La Montagne, Ludes. Not the best map. Uh, Pure Select, Sincillery up here in the north. Uh, it's a little fuzzy and I apologize for that. I, I highly recommend though, you can purchase these maps. I would certainly say, uh, get yourself the Larmont maps and take a look at them individually. So within the Montagne de Rome, uh, this is a Pinot Noir dominant region, about 8,200 8, hectare of land under vine. It's great for Pinot, the soil diversity helps the others thrive though. Uh, we mentioned it's sort of divided by the north and south facing slopes. The elevation peaks at about 950 feet above sea level. Uh, not only do you have the Marne River influencing it, but also the Ardre. Here's a list of the Grand Cru. We mentioned Sillery, Puy Selex, Beaumont, Cervez, Verzenay, uh, great producer there is Godemay, uh, Maillet Champagne, Verzi, Louvois, Fouzi, 
Uh, Anne Bonnet, of course, famous for Egli Aurier, Mary Noel Le Drew. Uh, the primer crew of importance, we also pointed out on the map, Talcher, Trapai, Lude, Murphy, uh, and Equel. Uh, other great producers in the area, Dutz, uh, but of course, plenty of others. The Obe, also Pinot Noir dominant, Kimmeridgian limestone in certain places, similar in size, rich in voluptuous styles from here. Uh, great producers for the Obe include Vouet at Sorbet, uh, Drapier, Fleury, Rosé de Jean, and Marie Corton. The Cote de Cezanne, Chardonnay dominant, much smaller, you can see, right? This is floral, fruity styles of Chardonnay. Uh, one of the great producers here is Ulysse Colline. I tried to, to do the same thing with the Cote de Blanc. This is just a picture of a map because it's really hard to find great maps. Uh, Cote de Blanc, we can always remember the Grand Cruz with the, uh, the acronym of CA Cool or California Cool. Um, and that is Cremant, Avis, Chouy, Oiry, Auger, and Lemonil sur Auger here in the south. A couple of important Premier Cruz, here's Cui. Um, again, not the best map, but what we have and Virtus down here in the south. And I went ahead and pointed that out. California Cool, Chouy, Oiry, Cremant, Avis, Auger, Lemonel, Sir Auger. Uh, Chouy really for white wines only. Avis known for that chalk and clay. Auger known for being a sun trap and really ripe styles from there. Uh, and Lemonel, Sir Auger known for being chalky and austere. Almost 100% Chardonnay in the region. Um, you can see it's about half the size, it's actually almost 40% uh, the size probably of what you see with Montagne de Rome and Valle de la Marne. Here you've got a pure bedrock of chalk and east facing slopes. And the tradition of bottling it at four atmospheres of pressure is still actually utilized um, on Pierre Gimenez Gastronome, Pierre Peter's Peril du Menil, uh, Lou Barrett's Peril, and Roterer's Vintage Dated Blanc to Blanc. So if you're looking for a softer style of Champagne, you can always look to the Cote de Blanc and these particular producers uh, for a little less atmosphere of pressure. Uh, we mentioned that Cretaceous Chalk, uh, important uh, Premier Cruz, of course, Cui to the north and Vertu in the south. Great producers here, uh, and there's a handful, Billicart Simon, Paul Roger, Pierre Peters, Bruno Payard, Tattinger, Louis Rodeter, Salas, and Salon, some of my favorite wines coming from the area. Uh, back to the Larmont map, this is for the Valle de la Marne. Um, this one's a little more clear, but still not perfect. We'll just zoom in here and you can see I. Uh, Haute Villiers up here. Here's Lumiere. Uh, uh, Meril Sarai, of course, being the 99 point Primer crew. Uh, still kind of tough to see all the best stuff though. Um, Mounier dominant in the Valley de la Marne, interestingly enough, uh, due to the, the late budding and early ripening because the area is awfully frost prone. This is one of the larger ones, again, 8.8 8, 000, excuse me, 8,800 <laughs> hectares under vine. Uh, these are ri river wines, right? It's the Marne River. Uh, they have ample body, they're generous flavors. The Grand Cru's here are I and Tour sur Marne. Important to note that great wines that come from the I, Jacassin and Cristal Rosé. Um, of course, that Premier Cru of importance that we mentioned, the Muriel sur I, um, famous for the Clos de Glacé vineyard for Philippe Bonat. Uh, Cumier, which houses René Joffre's uh, Empreinte. Bisouil, Dizzy for Gaston Chiquet. And of course, Haute Villiers, um, famous for where Don Pernon was the abbey of the Priory for a long time. Uh, producers here, we mentioned Philippe Bonat, but also Tarlant, Beresh, and one of my favorites, Musset. The left and the right bank actually here can offer pretty striking differences. The Riva Droid or the right bank uh, receives much more sunlight than the Riva Gauche or the left bank. General history of Champagne, the English transferred Champagne from cask to strong glass and were likely the first to drink it in the late 17th century. In 1724, you get the first mention of Mousseau. Uh, of course, Barb Nicole Ponsardine uh, from Veuve Clicquot develops Remuage or Riddling. Jean-Francois Chaptal investigates the relationship between sugar and fermentation somewhere around 1801. Uh, André-Francois finds a way to read the exact amount of sugar required to induce fermentation without breaking the bottles. Individual growers could not afford the costs of production, thus they began to sell their grapes to larger producers. 
there was a jump from about 300,000 bottles in 1800 to 20 million in 1880. So a huge uh, step forward for the production of champagne. And then phylloxera strikes in 1890. So um, in the original delimitation, repression of fraud was really key for champagne in 1908. Uh, of course, the growers revolted in 1911 with riots until the military stepped in. And then you had World War I bombing rhyme, uh, Hrem for four years straight. Uh, 1914 still believed to be one of the greatest vintages of the 20th century. <clears throat> the 1920s met with rising stocks due to global downturns. And so there was an ex uh, uh, excess of champagne stocks. Nazi control and the Otto Klebisch Weinfuhrer caused secretly walled up sellers to hide their inventory. Uh, actually, famously, Francois Tattinger landed in jail for passing off inferior wines that he labeled as reserved for the fire marked. Grapes of the region, we've mentioned uh, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Meunier. Pretty even planting, with Pinot Noir being a slightly uh, more than what you see in Chardonnay and Meunier. Uh, what they add to the final blend, structure, richness, and body for Pinot Noir, elegance and longevity for Chardonnay, and fruitiness and approachability for Meunier. But there are more. Those are the three main grapes. Of course, they make up 99.7% of production, but there's four other grapes that are allowed in Champagne. And that's Pinot Blanc Fry, otherwise known as true Pinot Blanc. It's a mutation of Noir. Arbon, Pinot Gris, and Petit Meslier. And in fact, there are a handful of producers out there that make um, Champagnes with all seven grapes. And there's a couple out there that make 100% Petit Mesliers as well. They're quite interesting. Typically your average vine age in Champagne sits somewhere around 20 years because low productivity is undesirable to most of the houses and the growers are trying to sell the big houses, right? Um, also, sometimes you'll see Provenage, which is called tip layer, also known, excuse me, as tip layering. This is a process of training a, a vine back into the ground um, and it's utilized in the Bollinger Via Vina de Francais, uh, their Tete de Cuvée. Climate of the region, the mean annual temperature is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a 1A on the Winkler scale, about as cool as it can get. Here you've got frost, you've got rain, you've got fungal disease, hail, all super serious concerns. Uh, rain can interrupt flowering, resulting in a second crop that's called a bouvereau. Usually you just get left on the vine. Uh, Champagne lies between the 48th and 49th parallels. As far as soil is concerned, chalk is sort of the king here. Porous bellumite chalk subsoils on the slopes that absorb heat to keep the vines warm at night and provide drainage in the wet climate. Bellumite has a high limestone content allowing for that drainage and it's linked to acidity in the wines. Uh, Microster, which is named for an extinct sea urchin, characterizes the valley vineyards. Clay is dominant down in the Ob in the south. So slow to adopt sustainable and organic viticulture long have they used Parisian compost to fertilize their vineyards, known as Le Bleu de Ville named after blue bags for composting that was outlawed in 1998. But you can still kind of see these uh, through some of the some of the different soil types. Um, styles in Ensapagement in the 18th century, they would color their wines with elderberry to achieve deeper hues and try to compete with burgundy. Um, there's another method that was actually uh, asked about a few years ago in an exam setting. Um, not that that's what all this is about, but just so you're aware of jetting. Jetting is something um, that was used for decades at Ferrari in Northern Italy, but it's been since adopted by Bollinger and Jacquard. And it's firing a small of, uh, amount of wine into the bottle to create foam. The foam will then eject oxygen and creates more consistency in the oxygen content during disgorgement. So that's an, a new process that you're starting to see in the area to help uh, level out the oxidation issues that they sometimes run into. Mallow, as we mentioned, didn't become the norm until the 60s. Uh, and then you have to worry about MCR, or concentrated grape must. And this can come from as far away as North Africa. It's made by reducing bulk juice in a process that removes all non-sugar elements. It's less oxidative in nature, but it's debatable as to whether or not it's superior to liquor de expedition. Um, general styles of champagne. Uh, we start with non-vintage, which is about three quarters of the market. Um, then you have vintage, which 100% of the blend has to come from that stated vintage and yet a maximum 80% of a vintage production may be sold as vintage champagne from a house. Blanc de Blanc, 100% um, Chardonnay. Any of the other white grapes that are grown in the region are not allowed in Blanc de Blanc. Blanc de Noir is 100% black grapes, but only Pinot Noir and Meunier. 
Uh, prestige cuvee or the tete de cuvee, we kind of mentioned that with Bollinger earlier. Uh, production differences here can include barrel fermentation, hand riddling, cork finishing, uh, all those things during secondary fermentation. Um, single vineyard champagne, not required to carry a vintage date, although many do. Um, special club prestige cuvee, currently at 27 members. Uh, they're estate bottled and vintage dated. Uh, the bottles and labels share identical design. And then rosé champagne. Um, here you can use saunier, although it's less common than blending. And of course, the only region um, in France that can blend to get rosé is champagne. We mentioned the special club, uh, that's known as the Club Tresors. And this is a very interesting um, uh, club here. The viticulture for the Club Tresors has to occur on the estate. It can only be RM producers. And we'll get to that, uh, what that means later on, but that's grower champagne. Uh, we mentioned viticulture has to occur on the state. The vinification and bottling has to occur on the state. They have to respect and uphold the club's charter. Um, let's see. The special club is sort of the top of the range prestige cuvee for all the members that are included. So the club tresors will declare a vintage as being worthy of special club um, and the prestige cuvees. Then each member may decide individually whether or not to produce a special club wine for that vintage. All the base wines and, and finished special club wines must undergo tasting analysis from the club. All the special club bottling share an identical label and bottle shape. Here is the current listing. You'll notice that it goes one through 28, but there's a gap at number 24. Um, so here are the current members. And there's only 27, which means Landois was the only person I've ever seen to leave the special club. Terminology, we uh, mentioned that RM on a bottle of wine, which is a matriculation number, is a code that's assigned by the CIBC. Um, you'll also see NM for Negociant Manipulant, which is Negoche. Um, Recoltant Manipulant, which is your grower producer, 95% has to originate from their own vineyards. There's a few others too out there. There's Cooperative Manipulant, which is a, a, a cooperative of growers. Uh, Recoltant Cooperature, which is a grower that vinifies at a co-op. Uh, Society de Recoltants, a, a union of often related growers who share their resources. Uh, negociant distributor, a middleman that sells wine he, she did not make. And then there's Marc d'Achature, uh, which is a, a buyer's own brand. And if you think of like, say Whole Foods maybe has a, their own sparkling wine production, they can call it uh, a Marc d'Achature, MA would be their matriculation number. Sweetness levels are always important to talk about with the liquor de expedition. Um, and it goes from brut nature or non-dosage non at zero to three grams extra brute zero to six, brute zero to 12. Uh, so there's a little bit of overlapping there. Extra dry 12 to 17, sec 17 to 32, demi-sec 32 to 50, and do, which is 50 or more grams per liter of residual sugar. Bottle sizes, always important to note. Um, there's a, a interesting way of remembering this and I'm sure everybody has different ones. Um, Porter bottle is uh, basically a split or a single glass, a half bottle, 375 milliliters. Of course, the bottle, traditional size is 750 ml. Your magnum is one and a half liters. And then you get into your um, interesting sizes, the Jeroboam, Rehoboam, Methuselah, Salmanzar, Balthazar, Nebuchadnezzar, Solomon, Sovereign, and the Primat. And it's pretty interesting to know that there's only one bottle size difference between Sovereign and Primat. Uh, before that, it typically moves in fours until you get up here. The Rayo bomb, of course, being discontinued in, in 1989, helps you remember that they move in fours after that. Four, eight, 12, 16, 20, 24. The Plaque de Musillet um, is the little metal cap that's right on top of the, uh, the Musillet. Different wine laws here, delimited in 1908, further reviewed in 27 that added the O. We mentioned those, um, those riots in 1911 it was basically driven by that. The AOP was added in uh, 1936, but the AOP doesn't need to be included on the label. It's the only region of its kind that doesn't have to say Champagne AOP. Uh, the CIBC was developed by de Vogue of Moda Chandon in 1941 to represent the industry and protect its interests. Today, the CIBC still moderates the relationship between the growers and producers. 
Merchant houses today own just over 10% of the vineyards. The controlled structures prohibits any farm, excuse me, firm from farming more than 15 hectare. 2009 marked an expansion of the Appalachian area. It was the first major change since 27. They increased the number of villages for cultivation from 319 to 357. And it was met with some skepticism from a lot of producers. Uh, yields are quite high, about 100 hectoliters per hectare in 2016 due to limits being set on juice extraction in 1992. So 102 liters of must for every 160 kilograms, kilograms, excuse me, of grapes or 2,550 liters per 4,000 kilograms, a mark of grapes, right? We talked about that earlier. That's the vin de, uh, to cuvee and vin de taille. That's the amount that's held a mark of grapes, 4,000 kilograms in a traditional cocard basket press. <clears throat> So you have higher yields here because you can only press so much from your grapes. So once you back that out, the restriction brings the final yield to about 66 hectoliter per hectare. Your pruning methods uh, for the region are Cordon de Royat, Chablis, and Valle de la Marne. Valle de la Marne is only allowed for Meunier, uh, and then you also find Guillot, both double and simple. But the important ones here are Cordon de Royat and Chablis. And only those first two may be used for Grand Cru and Premier Cru vineyards, and that's important to note. We mentioned the CIBC a couple of times, and I want to make sure and point out the differences between the CIBC and the uh, Shell de Cru. The CIBC moderates the relationship between the growers and producers, regulates the size of the harvest, harvest. it authorizes blocage and deblocage, which is the reserve and release of wine stocks, and it safeguards the protected designation of Champagne. The Echelle de Cru originally was the setting of the price paid to the growers for grapes. So until 1990, a scale or a shell would be given to a village. The villages achieving 100% were named Grand Cru, 90 to 99% Premier Cru, and then everything below that was village. So Muril Sarai in the Valley de la Marne and Tauchere in Montagne de Ram were the only two that ran into the 99%. So today the system's a recommendation. The pay scale's been abolished, but the Grand Cru and Premier Cru sites retain their titles. So forever, Myrtle Sarai and Tauchere are stuck being 1% away from Grand Cru, which is a real bummer. Um, producers uh, for the region, these are sort of um, house names, right? Dom Pignon was a cellar master from 1668 to 1750. Uh, Moda Chandon released the first Dom Pignon in 1921, uh, the sparking the popularity of the Tête de Cuvée. Gosset, founded in 1584, uh, it's really the longest running champagne house uh, because it was a still producer prior to making sparkling wine. Ruinart has the distinction of being the oldest and longest running sparkling house, started in 1729. Um, Veuve, Tattinger, Moda, Chandon, Delamont, all founded in the 18th century. Pomeries Nature was the first brute to market in 1874. 20,000 growers produced less than 20 25% of the total wine. And this is, uh, again, meant to showcase that uh, really the large brands still own the lion's share of the wine here. Champagne now accounts for only one in 12 bottles of sparkling wine that's produced. It's become um, uh, really popular worldwide to produce sparkling wine in different regions of the world that perhaps aren't quite as expensive. Most large houses though are headquartered in Huram, Epernay, and I. Uh, Philippe Ponant's Clos de Goisse, the first bottle in 1935. We mentioned that one for being in Muriel Sarai. Lanson, Gose, and Gratien avoid malolactic, as do Vilmart, Beresh, and Pehu Simene. Uh, Bollinger stores their reserve wines in larger bottles in Magnum. And then Mary Chassar uses cane sugar for dosage in lieu of beet sugar. Pretty interesting. Handful of vintage notes, um, perhaps more so than any other region, maybe Burgundy too and, and Chablis, but vintages can be uh, big swings when it comes to champagne. So your 10s and 11s were kind of rough. Uh, 2009 was okay, 08, awesome, uh, 04, good. You saw some 06s, pardon me, that were put into market. Uh, they sort of wanted to get out of the 06s so that they could get to their 08s eventually. 2002 was fantastic. Uh, your 95s to 2000s, all good. 88 through 90s, all good. Other great vintages of note back into the 70s, 85, 82, 79, 76, 75, and 1971. Hate to give you guys a vintage chart, but I think with champagne, it's certainly important to note. Um, I hope that presentation was helpful. I hope that 
uh, you take the presentation and can show it to your staff and use it to, to learn more about the region yourself. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, but we'll see you all next week. I think we have Germany on tap. That's a huge region. I'm probably going to break that down into a few different um, categories. I look forward to seeing you guys next week and uh, cheers.